us online and let's worship together. This is my first Easter Sunday here. I'm so glad to be here with you. Uh, if you would take out the bulletin that you received when you came in. Everybody pull this out real quick with me. Everybody real quick. You'll notice here at the bottom, you'll see a, a, a communication card. It's a perforated section. On the count of three, we're gonna tear it all together. So bend it, get it ready. Here we go. One, two, three, rip. 
Yes, oh, that's beautiful. You did so good. <laughs> guests, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. You're our honored guests. If you would just begin to fill this out as I'm talking with you now, this communication card. We wanna know that you're with us today on this Easter Sunday morning. If you're in uh, Hudson Hall, Wilson Hall, Baskin Chapel, also do this as well. Guests would just love to get a registration of your visit today. Later on in our service, we'll receive an offering. And if you would, wherever you are, when the ushers come forward, if you would just drop this communication card in the offering plate, uh, it'd be ready to go. Now, guess you're filling that out. And this is for everyone. If you look on the other side, you'll notice there are, are places to make decisions. Um, you can mark your decision on this card. We'll give an invitation at the conclusion of the service. And we're going to ask that you hold this card. And if you'll look around the room, you'll notice that there are prayer stations. There are two here at the front and two in the mezzanine level. There are some and down our concourse and in our atrium. Uh, there's, there's a prayer station just about everywhere you turn in this building. And this is a place where at the conclusion of our service, we will have people ready to pray with you, ministers there. They wanna receive any decisions that you wanna make. You can either drop it there in the blue bucket on that table, anywhere in this building. Uh, and then you can write your prayer request. There are cards there if you'd like to indicate prayer requests if, so we can pray with you or pray for you. We'll have people ready to receive you, talk about any decisions that you have. They're right here by these prayer stations. They'll be here posted at the conclusion of our service and all around the building. And so if you'll, you'll mark that decision, take it there when we're done together. It's going to be a great day. I want to tell you about something real quick, though, before we sing together. And it's something we call life groups. That's our Bible study community groups that meet all throughout the week. And that's where uh, this big church becomes small. And you meet friends that become family. If you want to do life together, journey with other believers, the, the life group is where that happens. We have people ready to connect you to a life group today. They're in their atrium right there to the right at our discipleship center. Go there, say, I want to connect with someone. I want to be able to love and serve with people. I want to be loved. I want to journey with others on this walk, this Christian walk that I'm going through. And they'll t help you do that. All right? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day that we get to praise you and worship our Lord and Savior, our risen Lord. We give you all of our thanks and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we give our Easter praise? Revelation 4.11 says this, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. We give our thanks and praise to Him today.
you read this scripture with me from Romans? But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. Praise the Lord. Stephanie, would you lead us on this song? The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon Him.
Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Amen. I love this promise from Zephaniah chapter 3. Yahweh, your God, is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with singing. He will bring you quietness with his love. He will delight in you with shouts of joy. This promise and every promise God has made to us has been kept, has been fulfilled, has found its completion in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He brings us quietness, peace through his love. This is not the peace the world offers us that is dependent on a certain set of circumstances. The peace that Jesus offers us is is stronger. It goes deeper and wider than we could even comprehend. You feel like your life is changing and unsettled. Jesus offers us his peace that is strong, steady, and secure. And it's being offered to us right now. If you're new to Brentwood this morning, this moment in our service is called a prayer and altar time. We're going to take the next three to four minutes, give you an opportunity to have an honest, one-on-one, face-to-face conversation with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Pour out your heart to him. Be still long enough for him to speak to you. Ask him for the peace that surpasses understanding. That's what this time is for. Our pastor will be kneeling down front and invite you to come pray over him, surround him with your presence, surround him with your prayers. Ask God to open eyes, ears, soften hearts to his word for us this morning. However the Holy Spirit is leading you, and come before him now. Let's pray together. Father, may your peace that surpasses all understanding guard, protect, surround us through the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his powerful name we pray. Amen. We sing with me. When peace like us.
Church family, it is my honor to introduce to you Hong Jun and Shi Jie Yu. And they are here to be baptized. They belong to each other, they're husband and wife. They're the proud parents of William, Brian, and Hannah. And they came to this country a few years ago, and as they have been here, they have met Christians and they've been exposed to the claims of Jesus Christ. And they are here today to say, that they follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And as we were talking, they wanted me to also let you know that a secondary reason they are here today is because of the love and care that they have been shown by the brothers and sisters of this church. And so, Hongju and Ju, this is your family. They are here to pray for you and encourage you just as you pray for them and encourage them. Amen. Amen. So Hong Jun, what is your Easter testimony today? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Because you have confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ in his death, and being raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. So my sister, what is your testimony today? Jesus is my Lord. Amen. Because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ in his death, and being raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. Thank you. We live in a world that is openly hostile to the Christian message. Uh, you know that. Many of you have had encounters in your workplaces or in your uh, neighborhoods uh, where people told you that if that's your faith, fine, but don't bother them with uh, telling them about it or trying to say anything about who Christ is to you. So how do you begin a conversation in a world that really doesn't want to talk? You do it with ministry. When I first started pastoring churches a bunch of years ago, you would begin an evangelism conversation by saying, the Bible says, and you would go from there. Now, you have to create a philosophical argument before you get to the theological argument. But the one thing that people will not argue with is if you're doing good in the community, if you're serving a local school, if you're working in a food bank. Uh, providing clothes for those who need them, health care for those who need it, on and on the list goes. Uh, when you came in this morning, you were giving some information about our Engage Middle Tennessee Day on April the 21st, uh, which is two weeks, two Saturdays from now. Uh, and it's our way to show Middle Tennessee the love of Christ in very real and tangible ways. Now, there's, there's something there that would ring everybody's bell, Okay. Uh, there's something there where you're going to say, that's something I would enjoy doing. Uh, that's something I'm curious about. That's something I want know, uh, to know more about. And when you go and you serve, somebody will ask you, why are you doing that? Why are you here? And that will open up the conversation. Uh, you saw uh, results of the Chinese church that we have. That's part of our congregation. Uh, across the hall, the, the deaf congregation is meeting. Uh, we are able to do international missions and never leave our own zip code. All because of your faithfulness, all because of your generosity of bringing your tithes and your offerings to this moment. We have the resources we need to respond when God opens up a door for us. So if you're joining us in Wilson Hall, Hudson Hall, or Baskin Chapel, the uh, uh, Ushers will be there uh, to come and serve you as well. Of course, in Hudson Hall, you'll have the buckets, and you know how that works. So in the sanctuary, ushers will be coming forward. So let's continue to worship as we give together. 
Lord Jesus, receive the gifts of your children, for we give them in great and excitement and celebration of what you've done in our past, eagerness to see what is coming in our future. We trust you with everything we are and everything we have, so use our gifts, our talents, our resources, so there's not a man, not a woman, not a child who doesn't know of your good news. We pray this in your name. Amen. stands an endless mercy tree every broken weary soul find your rest and be made whole stripes of blood that stain its rain shed to wash away our shame from the sky Salvation by the mercy tree in the sky between two thieves on the blameless prince of peace, bruised and battered, scarred and scorned, sacred head.
We will plant new churches. We will start regional campuses. We will break Brentwood off and we'll place it somewhere else. We will repurpose churches. We will help a congregation understand that this church can still be vital and important to the kingdom of God. If you look at the people who are around you now and do your ministry a little different, we have no more room in our bleachers. The only place left for us now is on the field where Jesus is still looking for the lost and bringing them home. And you and I are called to be on that journey and that work with him. This is why he came. This is why we're sent. Our culture is asking questions only Jesus can answer. Aren't you glad to be at a church that God trusts with hard things? The disciples were used to being confused. The disciples were used to being in a position where they couldn't figure out what Jesus was doing. In fact, we have several times where they came to Jesus and said, what did you say? What does it mean? Well, they'd ask a question after uh, a miracle, trying to help get some kind of context. I mean, yes, they had walked with Jesus for three years, but they had never comprehended him. Several times Jesus looks at them and says, how long do I have to be with you before you get it? But this week, this past week had been something that the disciples would spend the rest of their lives trying to understand, trying to put together. It started off with Sunday when they had come into Jerusalem riding on the back of a little donkey and the people had erupted in a spontaneous celebration. They had put their coats down in front of the donkey so his hooves did not touch the dirt. They had celebrated by waving palm trees, celebrating a returning king. They couldn't get enough of Jesus that day. The religious leaders, the political leaders had also noticed this king who was returning to Jerusalem. Oh, make no mistake, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He was coming into Jerusalem telling everybody who would listen, Jerusalem belongs to me. I am its rightful king. Tuesday, the religious leaders began challenge him after what they had seen Monday. On Monday, Jesus goes into the temple and sees all of the tables where the people had set up where they could buy and sell sacrifices, where they could exchange their money for the only type of coins that were, were accepted in the temple for a sacrifice. There was a, a little racket going on out front, and Jesus stepped into this and turned over the tables and chased off the animals and said, my house, my father said, my house will be a house of prayer and you've made it into a den of thieves. The interesting thing about the story of that is that nobody challenged Jesus. Now I'm thinking if I'm a little guy and I make my living here exchanging coins or selling little doves and, and everything, and Jesus turns over my table, he and I are going to have a discussion. And he's going to help me put my table back up. But nobody said that. When he turned over their tables, they said, that's okay, Jesus, I'll clean it up. There was something about him. There was something about the look on his face that they knew they had better not challenge him. Not now. Thursday night, he had gathered the disciples to celebrate the Passover. Each of them had done the Passover before. They knew it by heart. They knew the story of Moses. They knew the story of Egypt. They knew the story of the slavery and how God had miraculously set his people free and how they had to eat standing up and eat on the run. And then Jesus reinterprets it in a way it would take them a long time to fully, fully grasp. This is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. A few hours later, he was arrested. The disciples were caught off guard. No one thought Jesus would be arrested, not with all of the people in Jerusalem for Passover, but the religious and political leaders thought they were running out of time. And so in a matter of hours, they pushed Jesus through a kangaroo court. He was handed over to the soldiers to be tortured and prepared for crucifixion. And Friday, he was on a cross. Not one of the disciples defended him. Not one came to his aid. They ran. 
they hid. When he was finally dead, the soldiers gave him permission to take the body down. They buried Jesus in a tomb that was borrowed from a friend. They went back to the place where they were hiding behind locked doors, afraid that they would be the ones next. After all, Jesus has said, you see the way they treat the shepherd. Look for the way that they'll treat the sheep. And so they do what grieving people do. You've gone back home after a funeral, right? What do you do? You eat. You tell stories. You may even laugh again, but you're trying to think through what life is going to be like now without the person who has died. So the disciples are looking at each other, trying to figure out what is life going to be like now, now that Jesus is gone. The women were gathering together what they would need to be part of the funeral service that they would complete that next Sunday morning. But this was Sabbath right now. You couldn't do any kind of work like that on the Sabbath. They would just have to wait. And they barely waited. It was sunrise on Sunday. The disciples would be confused again. Let's pick up the story there in John chapter 20. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and she saw the stone had been removed from the tomb. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciples went out and headed for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came, but he entered the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the other cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw, and he believed. For they did not yet understand all of the Scriptures that said that he must die from the dead. And the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Let's pick up with verse 19. When the evening of the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, so I now send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, then they are retained. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As you came to the disciples so long ago, we pray, Lord Jesus, you will come to us in this place we're just as confused, we're just as anxious, and we need you just as much. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, they had been confused before, but now this day was just getting nuts. Uh, they were still trying to get their head around all that had happened when Mary Magdalene bre uh, bust in and tells Peter and John, the tomb's empty. The rock's been moved. He's not there. Now, this was, a, this was a fear of the disciples that in order to further discount Jesus or to further humiliate Jesus, they would take his body and they would rob him of the dignity of a proper funeral. It's also a, a, a teaching of, of the enemies of Christ uh, that Jesus did not really die uh, or that he did not re was not really raised from the dead, that we just stole his body and hid it. We've hid it really well. Nobody's been able to find it for 2,000 years. Um, but um, Peter and John couldn't figure out what was going on. You see, Mary was obviously a woman, and in those days, the testimony of a woman was not valid. They couldn't testify in court because you were a woman. I don't send many emails. I'm just telling you the historical context, okay? That's not Mike. I'm just telling you, all right? 
So Peter and John go to check it out to make sure. Now, of all the things John could tell us about the story, now understand, this is Easter. This is the most incredible story that the world has ever heard. The one thing he wants you to be sure you get about this is that he's faster than Peter. <laughs> you see, one of the reasons I believe the Bible is that, yes, it tells us the truth about Jesus, it tells the truth about God, but it tells us the truth about guys. Okay, every guy in here knows exactly what happened when they started running. And they know exactly why John told us he was fastest. You know these guys had raced before, right? Last one to the boat, to right neck, off you go. This had happened before. John wants you to know I was the fastest. Peter wants you to know he was the first to go in. Found the cloth found the cloth that they had wrapped his head with. The one thing they were missing was Jesus. Peter couldn't figure it out. Or maybe Peter didn't want to figure it out. What would you be thinking if you were Peter? And the last time you saw Jesus, you knew that he knew that you had denied him, not once, not twice, not three times. Three times you had denied him, and now Jesus isn't where you put him. John believes. John says on the way, on the way back, you know the conversation. John says, this is what Jesus was talking about. It's all making sense. And they get back and they lock the doors. Now they're trying to explain. Mary Magdalene tells her story again. Peter tells what he saw. John tells what he saw. They can't figure it out. Nothing makes sense. Where is Jesus? What are we going to do now? And Jesus is there. Did you hear a door open? Did you hear footsteps? Wasn't anybody paying attention? We know there are people looking for us who want to kill us, and now Jesus just walks in. Yeah. It was time the disciples knew that Jesus wouldn't let anything keep him from his friends, not even death itself. And now Jesus tells them, peace. Now, of all the things Jesus could have said, why that? <laughs> why peace? Now, there was a lot of times he had to say this to the disciples. A lot of times they would freak out. Okay? Uh, they're caught in the storm in the boat. Jesus is asleep. Remember the story? Jesus, they have to wake Jesus up to tell him they're going to die. Jesus, you may want to wake up. We're all going to die. That's what they say. Jesus gets up and goes, where's your faith? Don't you have any faith? Not when the boat's filling up with water. No, we do not have any faith. He walks across the water. He sends them ahead in the boat. He walks across, going to meet him on the other side, remember? They see him and think he's a ghost. There was all kind of stories about sailors who had died in Galilee, and they would come up from the bottom and grab you and pull you down. That's true. And now they were thinking, uh-oh, they don't think it's Jesus. They think it's a ghost. Isn't it funny? In those most intense moments of your life, you revert to your childhood. It's a ghost. Why? Well, that's what I was told as a kid. No, it's me. Relax. What would you have said if that was the first time? Ta-da! <laughs> told you so. Why are y'all looking? I told you I wouldn't be in the tomb. Jesus has this uncanny ability to tell the disciples what they need to hear. And what they needed to hear was shalom, peace. I'm here. Your hearts are worried. Your minds are confused. Be still. I'm here. Do you remember when you were a kid and you'd be scared and hurt and worried all at the same time? 
uh, you would fall, and the fall would scare you, and, it, and, and maybe your arms hurt, but you don't know how bad it's hurt, so you, you don't know what to do, so you just cry. And, 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 when, and when your parent comes in, they, they say, well, what happened? What's wrong? And you can't, you're trying to tell them everything at the same time. And all you get out is, right? That's all you can get out. How many of you, if I gave you permission, would stand up and say, I just because you don't have words. Life is impossibly hard. Bumper sticker says, get up early, jog, die anyway. And it's not that there's just one day where you'll die. There's all kind of little deaths, aren't there? Relationships are lost. Marriages fray. Dreams don't work out. Careers fizzle. And we find ourselves like the disciples, locked in an open room, afraid somebody is still out to get us, and we don't know what to say. And Jesus comes, comes to you. I tell you all the time that the good news of the gospel is not that you found Jesus. Jesus finds you. It's not the shepherd who was lost. It's the sheep. And standing in that upper room, Jesus tells the disciples and tells all of us who will follow behind, Nothing will keep me from getting to you. Paul would write later, what can separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus? Neither life nor death. Not death or any of the little deaths that come with it. Nothing will keep Jesus from coming to you. and telling you it's time to get busy. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. And they went. P Peter was crucified along uh, with Paul, but, but Peter was crucified hanging upside down. Paul was beheaded. Thomas, we think, died in India. Matthew died in Syria. James died in Jerusalem. On and on the list goes. We think only John died of natural causes of old age. John was exiled to Patmos. And there he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day when he appeared to me. Not one of the disciples ever changed their story. Not one of them ever recanted. Now, I know it's Easter. It, it, is, it is popular to have all the books now discounting Christianity, the lost books of the Bible. We didn't lose them. We threw them away. We've known about those books for years. We read them. Go, oh, this is not right. This is not authentic. And we threw them away. If we were known the world's going to dig that deep in the trash, we'd have buried them deeper. We didn't know. We just, we threw them away. They're not new. There's always the thing that Jesus really didn't die that he just passed out. And when he put him in the tomb, he came back to life, got out of the tomb, found Mary Magdalene, married her, and moved to the south of France. That is a real story, people. There are people teaching that. You got all kinds of problems with that. One, the Romans were professional killers. They would have made sure he was dead. We have people who carried his dead body and buried him. And we have people who witness the resurrection, and we have a tomb that is still empty. Amen. Nothing will keep him from you. And for some of you, 
That's some tough news, isn't it? That's some, oh, sure, you came to church, but, but you came here thinking that this would be the last place Jesus would look for you. Right? Sometimes the best thing you can do is hide in plain sight. Because you know if he comes, there's going to be some things you need to deal with. Kind of like Peter. But Jesus came anyway. Not to condemn, not to judge, but to rescue. Amen. Jesus is not hunting you to destroy you, judge you, condemn you beat you up. He's searching for you in desperation to rescue you. For some of you, it is good news. The only thing you know is how tired you are. How tired you are hiding from what happened in your past. How tired you are from having to deal with the mistakes you made. How tired you are about trying to be somebody you're not. How tired you are to keep on lying. It is the truth that will set you free. And that truth won't let death keep him from you even in this moment. So he comes. Same word to the disciples he has to you. Peace. Shalom, it is finished. Death is conquered. There's nothing for you to worry about. I'm the Lord of life on this side of death. I'm the Lord of life on the other side of death. So all the meaning and all the purpose comes from this moment of resurrection. And this moment is given to you. Just as Jesus came to the disciples so long ago, he now comes to you. Not to condemn you. To rescue you. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm not going to do anything to put you on the spot. But this may be a good time to get that card we gave you. And finish filling it out now. Here's what I'm praying about. Here's what I need somebody to talk to me about. And just give us a way to contact you and we will follow up, I promise you. Drop it off at one of these stations that you see, the prayer stations. Maybe find one of the ministers, one of the counselors and say, hey, here's what's going on. For some of you, it's as easy as becoming a member of Brentwood Baptist Church and we'd love to have you as part of our family. For others of you, it's a little tougher. Only thing you're aware of right now is how you've messed up. And it just can't be that easy that you tell the Lord that you're sorry and, and things be better. Listen, don't hear that it is easy. Hear that it is impossible for us. What Jesus did for us, we cannot do ourselves. But he died for your mistakes so that you're free from the consequences and the pain of that mistake. And his resurrection, gives you hope and purpose and meaning you didn't even know was real, but it's yours now for the asking. I know I'm saying a whole lot, just a handful of words. That's why our ministers will be hanging around those prayer stations, so you find one of them. Just tell them you want to know more about what Mike was talking about. They'll pick it up from there. However, the Lord has come to you this morning. He's waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. We pray the decisions we make are exactly what you want. Would you stand with me? As we begin to sing, our altars are open. Would you sing with me? No grave could contain all the glory.
ministers and counselors are making their way to the prayer stations as you go. Drop your prayer concerns there, your decision cards. God bless you and happy Easter.